Dungeons and Dragons is an incredibly creative game, limited only by your imagination and a complex and extensive set of rules. It has a wide and varied range of character classes available, all of them with their own niche. And if you like using swords and melee weapons, all of them have a way to do that effectively. But what about those of us who prefer bows? If you read through these things, you'd be forgiven for thinking that someone up there doesn't actually like bows. And the general assumption is that if you're playing, yeah. and the general assumption is that if you're playing an archer, you'll be a ranger, a rogue, sneak attack, or a fighter. But there is another way, and if you're able to get creative with your flavour and your descriptions, I truly believe there's quite a wide range of viable archer concepts out there. And to prove it, I'm going to make an archer of every single class, even that one. I'm going to talk about the feats and the races, delve into the subclass options, come up with some hopefully interesting concepts, and show you what I think their shooting style might look like in real life, so that not every combat is just... I, uh, I roll to attack. That's a one. A miss. Roll again. Oh, nice. 18. Cool. Eight points of damage. Some of these are going to be highly effective builds, which can make multiple attacks and deal lots of damage. Some of them, not so much. But hopefully they can provide you with some cool ideas and help to inspire you for your next Archer character. But before I get too deep into the class mechanics, I'd like to say a quick word about our sponsors, Dragon Air Silent Gods. Join D&D Legends in Dragon Air by clicking on the link in the description, where you'll also find exclusive bonus content codes. Dragon Air is a fantasy RPG that uses many elements that you'll find familiar if you're used to Dungeons and Dragons. It's got that familiar kind of Western fantasy medieval setting. It's got dice rolls and unpredictable combat, grid-based battle systems, tactical fights, and of course a character creation system that lets you customize the appearance of your character, choosing from various different fantasy races, and then mix and match them with fantasy classes and different ability scores to enhance and improve and customize your personal experience. The fights themselves are fun and chaotic and combined with out-of-combat exploration and looting, as well as character stories that develop as your character progresses. And for those of you familiar with Forgotten Realms lore, Dragon Air has collaborated with Dungeons & Dragons to introduce popular ranger character Drizdo Erden, who's nearly as iconic as me, into the game, along with his panther Guinevar, and they will fight off his evil nemesis Urtu. Drizd and Guinevar will have their own character story and progression, and will be joined by other familiar faces from the Forgotten Realms over the next few months as this collaboration continues. Dragon Air is available now on Windows, Mac, Steam and Epic with compatibility for Android and Apple. It's been downloaded more than 10 million times already, securing the top spot in over 10 regions since its global release, and its partnership with the world's most popular tabletop role-playing game can only mean great things for its future. I can't wait to see where it goes, and I hope I'll see you there. Download via the link in the bio, check out the content codes, fight alongside some iconic D&D characters, and have fun. Okay, we can't really talk about making archer builds without worrying first about feats. There's only a handful of feats which are suitable for archers, but most of them are fairly significant in their own right. You've got sharpshooter, crossbow expert, gunner, weirdly enough, and also piercer and the fighting style initiate. So let's dive into crossbow expert. If you want to play a crossbow character, this feat is pretty much essential. It takes away the loading requirement from crossbows so that you can just keep shooting them without needing to load them. The other thing it does is lets you make a bonus action attack with a hand crossbow, making it faster than any other ranged weapon in the game. I hate this feat with a passion. Not just because I really like bows, and the whole value of bows is that they're faster in trained hands than an equivalent crossbow would be to load and shoot, but also because I don't like any feature which makes one's playstyle strictly superior over another. And there is no doubt that for a lot of builds, the hand crossbow with crossbow expert is going to be a lot more viable than any other type of ranged weapon. The main thing that crossbow expert does for some builds, which I really like, is it lets you use your ranged weapons when you're close in with melee with an opponent. So it lets you shoot someone who's close up, but it also lets you fight someone close up and then shoot further away. And that's why I want to mention gunner, because gunner does the same thing as well as some firearm proficiency, but you can ignore the firearm proficiency because it also gives you an extra one point in dex. So if you've got a floating dex score and you want to round it off, gunners are potentially quite a good option for doing that. The other feat that's really good if you've got a floating ability score is piercer. Piercer will apply to any ranged weapon, barring perhaps slings. Um, 
and it just increases your damage on a critical hit and makes your damage output more consistent. Nothing bonkers, but it does help to narrow the gap with people who've got fighting styles that kind of keep their damage output consistent rather than their accuracy. And then there's Sharpshooter. And on paper, Sharpshooter is great. It removes the penalties for shooting around cover and for shooting at longer range. And it also lets you do additional damage at the cost of some accuracy whenever you make an attack, which makes you an absolute monster if you've got multiple attacks and anything else that buffs your accuracy, like the archery fighting style. But like anything that's considered essential for optimization, it can lead to a quite repetitive and boring style of play. So if you do start taking sharpshooter, have a think about what that looks like for your character. Is the damage increasing because they're drawing it past their normal anchor point? Meaning that they get more power out of the bow, but they're not as used to aiming it that way? Or are they increasing the damage by adding multiple arrows to the same shot, making it slightly less likely that they'll pierce the armor, but when they do, they do a lot more damage. Or perhaps they have a particularly vigorous form of katra, where they push the bow forwards on release to generate extra power. Or if they've got some spellcasting ability, they might imbue the arrow with some magic as they shoot. Whatever you choose to do, just think about how that will look and it will help to make your character more fun to play and more fun to play with. I should mention while I'm talking about feats, the archery fighting style. It's not technically a feat in and of itself, but you can take it as a feat if your character wouldn't otherwise have it. Um, but it's available as standard for level one fighters and level two rangers. This gives you a flat plus two bonus to your attacks with all ranged weapons. And because it's available only really to characters who would have extensive training in the use of bows, I imagine that it takes the form of a much more consistent and reliable shooting style. Some classes might use a bow in a fairly like haphazard way with whatever works, but I feel like if you've got the archery fighting style, you at the very least have a consistent anchor point at the same place. So you're always gonna draw the same point on your face every time you shoot. But I personally think that the creators of the game shot themselves in the foot, no pun intended, when they made this because it puts archery outside of their bounded accuracy rules. It makes bows and crossbows and darts and slings just that little bit more likely to hit as a rule. And consequently, I've noticed that most of the magical items that you can get as an archer tend to lack any kind of to hit bonus in the same way that like magical swords. So you start off at an advantage, but gradually over time, as everyone picks up plus two and plus three weapons, you're actually worse off overall. So I personally would prefer it if archery had had a fighting style similar to everything else where it does something for your damage. That said, if accuracy is a huge part of your character and that kind of skill and training and experience is useful, consider taking that feat as well. And then there's races or lineages or whatever you want to call them. For the most part, they cover the standard fantasy gamut and, for, and largely for these builds, I'm not too interested in prescribing a particular race for a particular build. But as a general rule, there are a handful of races which are really useful for archers. Number one, elves. You just, you, just, you just can't beat them. The thing about elves is that they naturally have proficiency in short bows and long bows. So if you're playing a build that wants to use short bows and long bows, but you don't have it in your class, elves are a fantastic choice. But the interesting thing about that is that if the class that you're playing as already has those proficiencies, it's kind of moot. You don't need extra longbow proficiency. It doesn't do anything to have it twice. So an elf ranger only gets just as much advantage as any other ranger in using a bow. The main other thing that I would say that you might want to get from your race, aside from like fun flavor, and for the most part, pick the one that you think is coolest. Uh, but the only other thing you might sometimes want is something that helps to get you out of trouble. One of the main features of ranged weapons is that they have disadvantage when you're in melee with an enemy, but moving out of that melee range means that you're quite liable to get shanked by the enemy on your way out. But some races have a way around that. Goblins, for example, as a bonus action, can disengage from an enemy, move out of their way, and then use their entire action to pour arrows into that opponent. Meanwhile, Gith can have the ability to misty step out of trouble and then do the same, while Herengon have a ridiculous bonus action leap, which doesn't provoke opportunity attacks, but the king of ridiculous archer concepts in the races is either the Aladrin or the Shadokai. Both of these get a bonus action teleport, but they can do it multiple times a day to get in and out of trouble. And they also have the ability to choose weapon and tool proficiencies when they take a long rest. So if you need that extra longbow proficiency, you can get it. And if you don't, you can use it for something else. And if that wasn't enough, their teleports come with additional abilities that can help add flavor and durability to your character. Also a special mention to the shifter race, who are a kind of like semi-wear person. 
they get the ability to move out of the way as a reaction when an enemy moves close to them. Okay, that's enough rambling. Let's get on to the classes. So in no particular order, except for alphabetical, we're gonna start with Artificer, or Artificer. I don't know how you say it. Artificers are intelligence-based half-casters who are normally portrayed as engineers or scientists, but their shtick is that they can use any tools that they're proficient with to cast their spells and use their abilities, which means they're just as dangerous with a set of Allen keys as they are with some seasoning and a frying pan. But when it comes to archery, there is one particular subclass I wanna talk about. Battlesmith gets a bunch of combat-oriented spells, they can get their extra attack once they hit level six, and they also get a steel defender, which is in theory some kind of construct robot. But if you went the chef's utensils route, it could just as easily be an unhinged cheese golem. Either way, this thing can assist you in battle and gives you a bit of that kind of Beastmaster Ranger vibe while keeping you much less nature grounded. But the key thing I wanna talk about for fighting style is the fact that they can use any magical weapon with their intelligence modifier. And because they're artificers, all they have to do is spice up their weapon a little bit and it becomes magical. So they can take an ordinary ranged weapon and suddenly it no longer needs ammunition and they can just shoot all day. And because they're using intelligence, they're one of the only classes whose backup weapon can then be some kind of ridiculously oversized sword without needing to specialize in every single ability score. But in visualization terms, this also creates a really interesting feature because these archers are no longer relying on dexterity to shoot their bow. They're not doing fast instinctive aiming. They're not relying on their body to aim them, they're using their mind. So of all of the classes, this is probably the one that spends the most time at full draw, slowly working out the windage and then making the shot, very careful and placed because they don't need to actually draw and knock an arrow each time. They've got that extra few seconds. Think how Olympic archers shoot. If you ever watch them, they spend a lot, a lot of time aiming getting everything as precise as possible. And that's the kind of vibe that I pick up from an intelligence-based archer. They might even add little things like spirit levels and such to their bow to help them figure out what kind of range they need to shoot at. The other thing to remember about this build is that they spell cast through their magic weapons. Obviously you could just crack out your set of Allen keys or what have you, but why not try and flavor your spells as coming from the bow, either through magical arrows that work in a way a bit like Hawkeye's in the Avengers, or by using the bow itself to yeet magic at your opponents. If you've got a particular vibe that you want from your tools, see how you could work that in to what you're actually doing with the weapon. As for races, anything you like can be fine with this build. Because you can use melee and ranged weapons equally, you don't need to worry too much about getting away from combat. For me, I'd be tempted to go something like Simic Hybrid and take some weird and wonderful animal features um, and go into like a whole Dr. Frankenstein vibe with additional parts added to the weapons that are taken off slain enemies that kind of give it different abilities and flavor the spell casting. And the second class, which is by no means second class, is the Barbarian. They're known for not really needing armor, soaking up lots of damage and dealing heavy hits to their opponents. Barbarians are highly associated with melee weapons to the exclusion of ranged combat. And of all of the classes, I'm not really mad about it in this case. Because if you're gonna fulfill the role of a battlefield tank and protect your allies, you're gonna need to be in close. Or are you? Because the Ancestral Guardian subclass lets you draw on ancestral spirits to protect your allies. And you don't need to be in melee, and you don't need to be using a melee weapon for that to work. All you have to do is hit an enemy with a weapon attack, and they are gonna have disadvantage on attacks against anyone other than you and anyone other than you has resistance to the damage of their attacks. Which actually works very well if you're a long way from them. Because if they're in melee with your ally, they're then gonna have to make a choice between coming out of that melee and provoking an opportunity attack or staying there and having a harder time fighting. The other feature you get from this, which is really, really cool, is the ability to absorb some of the damage that is meant for an ally, taking 2d6 off it, which later becomes more and more and more. And you only need to be within 30 feet to do that. So a mid-ranged archer character focusing on dex and con will have a reasonably good armor class and they'll be able to really annoy your enemies. You'll miss out on some of the strength weapon-based features that the barbarian gets, but as long as you keep your strength okay, you always have the option of bringing out a melee backup and using your reckless attack to continue to be at least a bit effective with it. As for the archery style, I imagine that a barbarian archer is gonna be reasonably aggressive in how they shoot, using both hands with quite dramatic motions. Their release is probably quite forced and powerful, which produces a very kind of lunging shot that makes it feel like they're itching to get into melee with their enemy. 
Alternatively, when you enter your range, you could portray it as becoming possessed by one of these ancestral spirits. And so you could choose different archery styles depending on which spirit you've chosen to draw on. In fact, this is exactly the playstyle that I recently did in a game called the Shattered Shard, which you can find links for on my page, where I chose to play as the new type of hobgoblin, which kind of emphasizes the assisting allies thing with some bonus action help actions, um, and helps make up for the lack of archery fighting style with the fortune from the many, which lets me add a slight bonus to my ranged attacks when I miss. I'm getting cold, so I'm gonna put a shirt on. Next up is Bard, which incidentally was my nickname at university. Bards are a great class, full spellcasters who can channel their magic through their instruments. I can't play that. They have access to a wide range of buff and debuff spells and some great crowd control options. But when it comes to using weapons, they've also got a couple of great subclasses for that too. The College of Valor can use any weapon they like and gets their extra attack at level 6 along with some combat-based bard options, while the College of Swords lets them channel their magic through a melee weapon instead, and use fancy blade flourishes to achieve unusual effects in combat. And this is the first time I'm gonna get a little bit mad, because for my money there's absolutely no reason why College of Swords couldn't also apply to ranged weapons. And to an extent it does, so that's the class I'm gonna focus on right now. If we're playing a ranged character, College of Swords has a few features which are completely useless to us. The first is proficiency with scimitars. The second is a fighting style which is either for one-handed or dual-wielding melee weapons, both of which we can ditch. But if you've got a nice DM, they might be willing to let you swap that fighting style for the archery one, or at least something else, like a feat maybe. And the other thing is the ability to use melee weapons as a spellcasting focus. And again, if your DM's nice, they might let you use a ranged weapon for that. If they don't, see if you can get hold of a Ruby of the War Mage to get the same feature. It's a really cool thing, and it's just a big shame that this is specific to melee weapons. Given that, the flourishes they get aren't. And that's the key thing we're gonna rely on here. The weapon flourishes that you have as a College of Swords bard allow you to do things like make an attack with a weapon that then puts you into a defensive stance that increases your AC, which for my money involves some kind of really dramatic flourish that keeps you low, or even shooting during some sort of evasive maneuver. The second maneuver you get allows you to shoot an enemy, knock them back, and then use your, and then use your reaction to move up to your speed towards them. It's intended to help you get across the battlefield quickly, but with a bow you could flavor it as some kind of magical grappling hook effect that you'd hit and then pull yourself inwards. Or you could just use it to Baldur's Gate style yeet people off cliffs. Remember, you don't have to move in close afterwards. Your reaction is optional. Remember, there's no save associated with this flourish, so you can use it even on enemies who are very strong. But don't tell your DM I said that. The third flourish. It's a little harder to manage with a bow. It lets you deal bonus damage to an enemy in the distance while also damaging something within five feet of you. Now, most of the time you're gonna have disadvantage if you've got an enemy within five feet of you, but if you've got room for the gunner feet, or if you wanted to take crossbows and you do crossbow expert, that allows you to make that shot as normal. Think of it as like ducking under their attack and then catching them with the arrow as you shoot the further opponent. There's some real potential for very horrifying flavor on this, and it's a quite fun feature. When you're picking races for this build, try and pick one that has the ability to get out of melee range, because you've got a few features which only work when you're in trouble. Eladrins in particular have a really cool thing that lets them teleport in and charm opponents, which is useful out of combat as well, if you fancy giving that a go. Not to mention that will give them proficiency with longbows. As for how a bard would shoot, they're using dexterity, which means that they're probably relying on a relatively instinctive shooting style, but they don't have that kind of formal weapons training that, say, a fighter or a ranger has. I imagine they'd shoot a bit like modern-day trick shooters, using whatever technique works in the moment to get their shot, and then practicing relently in different styles and techniques that they can use for different tricks. Remember, your extra attack and blade flourish give you some excellent damage for your bread and butter attacks, but you still have access to the bard's full spellcasting prowess, so don't forget to use that to create effects that can enthrall your opponents and change the nature of the battle before busting out the trick shooting while you concentrate on a spell. But with magical secrets, you also get access to arguably the best ranged weapon spell in the game, Swift Quiver. 
which lets you make two ranged attacks as a bonus action every turn. So, so if you've taken Sharpshooter, you can have ranged damage output equal to any fighter in the game. And if you haven't, it lets you continue making your regular attacks while also using your action to cast damaging and debilitating spells on your opponents. It's a great playstyle that should not be slept on. And then you have Cleric. Clerics draw their strength from the powers of the gods. They have access to a wide range of healing magic and are often portrayed beating the ungodly with the equivalent of a papal scepter. But as a rule, they're no worse with bows than they are with any other kind of weapon. But the thing is, with your wide range of defensive and offensive spells, you're going to spend most of your time using magic. If you want to really lean into the use of weapons, then go for a war cleric. They can use their channel divinity to make one of their attacks obscenely accurate, even if they're not looking what they're doing. Shit, that was actually really accurate. <laughs> and later on, they can also attack as a bonus action, allowing them to semi-keep up with other martial characters. But while that's quite effective, it's not particularly exciting. And if it was up to me, I would go for a Twilight Cleric. With 300 foot of dark vision that they can share with their allies, lots of sea invisibility features, and some nice cloaks of safety, and the ability to fly, they effectively become the party scout seeing threats in the darkness long before they can see you, with advantage on initiative to start taking them out. And while they don't get any extra attacks, their regular attack starts to add increasing amounts of radiant damage as they get more powerful to burn up those unholy foes. Their Cloak of Twilight effectively creates a sanctuary around them, which later on can give them half cover. And if, and if they're also using their limited flight ability, they can stay well out of range of enemies and then quickly dart in where they need to to do healing to their allies. And while they could use all sorts of different archery styles, my favourite one is that they're actually not that good at it. They worship a god like Sehanin Moonbow, who's a variant of Saloon, who has archery as part of her domain. While the archer themselves might have really inconsistent and bad form, drawing like this with the bow to the chest and not full draw, or drawing it somewhere up like that and not being able to pull it all the way back, they worship a god that can correct their shots, and so they always seem to hit just as well as anybody else. Not only that, but I would flavour the spiritual weapon as being a magical arrow. You shoot it out as a bonus action, and it spends the rest of combat flying around zapping everything like Yondu. That way, it can keep dealing damage while you focus on other stuff. Obviously, for a race for this one, I'd go for something with high levels of movement speed. A bonus action disengage or teleportation is nice, but also going for something like a tabaxi, who can, when they need to, just zoom across the battlefield, allows you to stay at a distance and keep shooting, but still provide that support when you need to for allies in the front line. Next up, we have druids. And druids make me furious. Because I would absolutely love to have a druid who's great at using a bow. It feels like something that would kind of fit in with their vibe, and I know Ranger covers that to an extent. But after playing God of War, I have a hankering for someone that's effective with a bow in combat, who can then also just change into a bear and maul people. <sighs> but alas, we do not have that. Druids have some of the worst spread of weapon proficiencies in the game. And despite claiming to like mostly things made of wood and natural materials, they don't get any archery proficiencies. While also getting scimitars. Riddle me that, Batman. Which means that if you want to use bows, you're either going to have to multi-class or you're going to need to play a race that has bow proficiencies, which probably restricts you mostly to elves. That said, and we're going to get sneaky here, if you do want to play a druid who uses a bow, there is a subclass which kind of has it covered. And it, again, I don't like it. I don't like it, but it's there. This is the Circle of Stars. Now, don't get me wrong, I like the subclass Circle of Stars. I think it's phenomenal. But for creating an archer character, they have this ability where they summon a mantle of stars which draws on the constellation of an archer, and that allows them to use their bonus action to make a ranged attack on all of their turns. It's wonderful. It's incredible flavour. It's highly evocative, and it's not a ranged weapon attack. It's a ranged spell attack, so I feel dirty even including it in this selection. But it explicitly says it's an archer, it explicitly says it shoots a celestial arrow, <sighs> and it's about as good as we get with the druid. So take that, keep your decks reasonably high, take your bow, and then you can make two very different ranged weapon attacks on your turn. Uh, my favourite way of flavouring this would be to do them both at the same time on the same opponent. If you can, it's not always optimal. So you shoot like this, and at the same time, like behind you and beyond you, this starry form comes and takes the same shot 
Um, and with any look, it creates this really cool effect of <laughs> both flying towards the target at once. So take your circle of stars, take your elf. Astral elf is a particularly good one because you get your lovely little bonus action teleports and it really fits in with the starry theme. You've traveled among the stars, you've come down and you brought back some of that astral radiance with you to channel the stars into your archery. But yeah, someone needs to either massively improve Magic Stone or make a ranged version of Shillelagh because druids are crying out for some way to effectively use these things. And then there's Fighter. Fighter, my beloved, what can we say about you? Well, firstly, we can't say anything about Fighter without getting our arms out. Fighter is a solid contender for the best archer class in the game. Regardless of the subclass you choose, you get access to proficiency with all weapon types, including longbows and any kind of crossbow you might wish to use. You get proficiency with all armors. You get more ability score improvements than anyone else. And you get more attacks than anyone else. And with your action surge, that means you can be making eight attacks in one turn without any extra shenanigans going on. It also has, as far as I can tell, the only subclass in the game that is specifically geared towards using ranged weapons. Unfortunately, Arcane Archer is often maligned because its bread and butter, the magical arrows that it can infuse, can only be done twice per rest. Which doesn't feel like a lot when you've got a battle master churning out way, way more trick attacks than that. But for what it's worth, it's the only class in the game that lets you curve arrows around obstacles, or even shoot them through multiple targets. And later you can use a bonus action to curve a shot that misses into a different target. Which is a very cool feature and well worth picking up, especially if you want to use your sharpshooter to reduce your accuracy on attacks for bonus damage. That lack of chances to use your magic arrows can grate after a while. So if you want to recreate the kind of trick arrow shots that people like Hawkeye and Green Arrow use, you might be better going off for Battlemaster. They have more chances per rest to use a wider variety of tricks to trip opponents, disarm them, frighten them, and even create openings for other allies to use attacks. But even Battlemaster is not my favorite. For this build, we're gonna go for the slightly lesser known Echo Knight. Echo Knights can create duplicates of themselves around the battlefield and can make attacks from any of those positions. This effectively lets them ignore some of the restrictions on bows, since if they're stuck in melee, they can get their ranged duplicate to make the attack. Or they can use a bonus action to switch places with them. They do have one feature which has to be melee, and that's an additional attack they can make on their turn from the position of their duplicate. But that's actually a good thing for this build, because for our race, since we don't need to worry about mobility, we're going to pick Dampir. Now Dampirs have a load of cool stuff. They can move quickly, they get dark vision, or they get like permanent spider climb, meaning they can stand on the ceiling and shoot and stay out of range. They also have a bite attack that runs off of their constitution. And that lets them either heal or draw power from an enemy to empower their next attack or ability check. And because it runs off their constitution, which is something you want to be reasonably high anyway, they're probably not too bad at it, even if they're an archer. And they don't have to draw an extra weapon because they do it with their face. So this opens up the option of playing a build who mostly shoots from a distance, but occasionally their shadowy duplicate steps in, draws some blood from an enemy, and allows them to make their next shot with even greater accuracy. Or heal themselves mid-combat. For their fighting style, fighters are ostensibly very highly trained. They're probably going to use a quite formalized and militaristic way of shooting, which means if they use war bows, they'll probably start high, draw down like this with the arched back. But as they progress and get extra attacks, they're probably going to go from this very military, relatively formal style into something a bit wackier and more speed shooting based as they become more of an adventurer and less of a soldier eventually moving to the kind of styles where you hold multiple arrows in your hand to speed up your shooting, or even using modified speed shooting quivers like this to maximize their rate of shooting. Okay, just had a lunch break, back in time for monks. Monks are a classic combination of spiritual warriors who draw their energy from the harmony of the universe, and low down dirty brawlers that will punch your kidneys out through your back. And whether the character does or not, the players tend to take an unhinged amount of glee in a number of powerful blows they can strike to an enemy. They're also incredibly fast, highly agile, great at dodging, and fit in with a large number of the general agile archer tropes that you sometimes find. Except for one thing, they do not typically use bows. But that doesn't mean that they can't. 
There is a subclass of monk that is specifically designed to be able to use ranged weapons as well as melee. Kensei is by no means the flashiest of monks, and if you're planning on fighting mostly in melee, it's probably not the best option. But for a ranged character, it gives you the option of using a bow as a monk weapon, making your weapon attacks magical, and then later on enhancing them so you can take a normal bow and make it into a plus three weapon. You also get a free bonus action, which is rare for monks, that you can use to increase the damage output of your ranged attacks. But if you've got enemies close up, you can shoot at them and then immediately run in and kick the crap out of them. And while it's not the most optimized way of fighting, it's a very, very fun archer build. And with the addition of some of the new Tasha's Cauldron features, you can also spend a key point to make your shots more accurate. And if you've already spent a key point on your turn, you can make a weapon attack as a bonus action, which is one of the only ways you can do that with a longbow. Is it the best way to play a monk? Probably not. Is it one of the more fun ways to play an archer? I would say probably. And especially if you've got room in your build for a sharpshooter feat, then there are a lot of things as you progress that make the Kensei very, very good at consistently hitting the target and getting that bonus damage. Because monks have a lot of bonus actions, actions and reactions, many of which are linked to each other, you probably want to be quite careful choosing a race so that you don't conflict your options. However, because this is a slightly non-standard build, there are a lot of options for taking feats to enhance it. Some way of making ranged attacks in melee, like the gunner feat, allows you to use your bow and your kicks and punches in the same turn. Or alternatively, taking something like Crusher or Mobile can let you get out of range after using your kicks without needing to spend key points on disengaging. It's also worth noting that a lot of the magical bows in the official rules don't have a plus one, plus two, or plus three modifier. So you could combine something like the Oath Bow with the Kensei Sharpen the Blade to make it a much more effective weapon. So, Kensei, very fun option. I do recommend it. But if you want something a bit weirder, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything has added a new optional rule where you can take one of your weapons at dawn and you can turn it into a monk weapon. And the rules for that are quite restrictive, but one of the things that does qualify is a short bow. So if you want to play a monk who uses a short bow, then you can play them as any subclass you like. So I present to you the Way of Mercy Archer. The Way of Mercy Archer is a conflicted character who mostly uses a bow because they know that if somebody gets in close, they can really cause them a bad day. So they stay back and use the bow as a kind of like peaceful way. And then when they do encounter an enemy right up close, then they will almost always pump a key point into it to do hands of harm, which deals additional damage and potentially poisons the target. There's no saving throw required. They will have disadvantage on their attacks. You're then free to proceed to retreat to a safe distance. You also can use that phenomenal movement speed you've got after you've taken your shots to fly in close and hands of healing one of your friends right in the face. It's a nice mobile support archer and gives you some fun options, but the actual range damage output is not phenomenal. As for the shooting style of a monk, it's going to vary a little bit depending on your character. A Kensei in particular, using Kensei's shot, has the potential to be relatively slow and be using a kind of Kyudo style of archery, which has a very, very long draw. But I could also see a monk as a candidate for a very like fast and brutal archery style, keeping their hand mostly free, kicking things, and then making their shot quickly. Like the bard, they're probably adept at shooting from a variety of positions to make the most of their ridiculous agility and allow them to get the drop on their opponent. Okay, slight switcheroo, I just had a new bow arrive in the post, so I'm gonna give that a try while I talk about Paladin. Like the monk, paladins are holy warriors. Unlike monks, they almost certainly wear shoes. Paladins are typically portrayed as a knight in shining armour, with a big heavy sword, or even a sword and shield, that they use to power divine energy into their deadly smites. They also have access to a large number of prepared spells that they can change daily. Built-in healing that doesn't require any spell slots, a damage option that doesn't require one of their spell choices, and powerful auras that protect their allies and an have additional effects as they level up. So someone out there really likes paladins. Unfortunately, it's not me, because for reasons that I can't particularly fathom, they explicitly exclude ranged weapons from the majority of their class options. But given, but given how stonkingly powerful paladins are at base, a slight disadvantage probably isn't the worst thing. It can be a bit difficult going into a game knowing that you're not optimizing your character, but it can also be a refreshing choice that lets you focus a little bit more on the roleplay side of things. So here's a couple of options that you could take. 
Number one, an Oath of Redemption Paladin who uses bows because they know the bows are less dangerous than their other weapons and is afraid that they might lose control if they go into melee like they have in the past. You play this character as actively avoiding using melee weapons at all costs and only when things become extremely dire do they break out the sword. When they finally do break out the sword, they become an absolute monster, burning through spell slots as they power everything they have into slaying their opponent. For the majority of the time, this might feel frustrating if you're not geared up for it, but if you play it right, it can lead to some absolutely fantastic moments. But if you want to have fun with the ranged options while you play them, my recommendation is to go the Oath of the Ancients, also known as the Fey Knight. This has heavy Feywild-style connotations, and I'd recommend playing a race that plays into that, such as the Eladrin, or, or the new Hobgoblin, or even a Fairy, or something like that. Grab your bow, take it up, and make use of the options that the Fey Knight has. Such as Misty Step for getting into and out of trouble. And since you're not using your spell slots on Divine Smite, you can use your level 1 spell slots on Ensnaring Strike to entangle opponents and debilitate them in combat. Level two. level 2 can go on your Misty Step, but you can also pump spell slots into your Branding Smite, which also only just requires a weapon to hit. Fantastic if you find yourself in a place where you have lots of invisible opponents. And if you think that's going to be a problem, take the blind fighting, fighting style at the beginning, because you don't have access to archery, so you might as well take something that gives you a little bit of utility. Level 3 and 4 pa Paladin spell slots can go into lots of the non-smite spells. Use them to actually take advantage of the range of spells that Paladins have that never get used because they keep Divine Smiting. And don't sleep on Find Greater Steed, because flying around the battlefield is a huge buff to ranged characters. But once you get access to your 5th level spell slots, you can use your Branding Smite to actively take an opponent out of the fight and deal a chunky amount of damage to them. You've got a bunch of auras that can not only help your allies to resist saving throws, but also protect them from the damage of spells. So you're going to stay back as an archer and protect your spellcasters from enemy spells, while your melee guys go and do whatever your melee guys do. And if somebody does happen to come in close and start threatening them in melee, not only have you got your control spells and your ensnaring strike, but you can also just whip out a short sword and lay them out with some incredibly powerful smites because you haven't burned all your spell slots on them already. As for the shooting style, I personally think a paladin is gonna go somewhere between a cleric and a fighter. They're not quite as inexperienced in combat as a cleric, and they do have some weapon training as part of their background, but they didn't train exclusively in bows, so they're probably a little bit uncertain, and someone like a ranger or a fighter might mock their shooting style. But the way they pump magical power into their attacks is very unique, so whatever their draw style, they might whisper a prayer into their fletching before shooting or else call down on their gods and then draw down, bringing the power into the arrow before release. They probably have a very esoteric and unique style, particularly with their Feywild connotations. So lean into that and allow them to smite the mighty with their bows. And then we get to my sweet cheese, my good time boys, Rangers. Rangers are as close as D&D gets to having an archer class. And by reputation, they seem to be the only class that people think of as being archers. They have access to all of the spells in the game that explicitly pertain to ranged weapons. All, what, like four of them? All ranger subclasses have proficiency with all weapons, access to the archery fighting style, and snaring strike, hail of thorns, swift quiver at later levels, lightning arrow midway through. So you probably only want one of those in your kit, and you've got a really limited number of prepared spells that you can't change easily. So you pick your faves and you go with them. And most people's fave for a ranger is going to be Hunter's Mark. It's a level 1 spell that allows you to add bonus damage to your attacks against a particular chosen target, allowing you to hone in and make all of your shots count. So build-wise, you're probably going to just do as the ranger do, but I would like to give a special mention to a couple of particular subclasses. The first one is the Hunter. Hunter is the classic ranger subclass. Um, it's often slept on, but it's really, really cool, albeit not always for D&D. Because what Hunter specializes in is shooting multiple enemies in a single turn. So very early on, they have the option to shoot two enemies close together when they would ordinarily just shoot one, giving them a very early extra attack that you could flavor as a kind of twin shot with two arrows going in different directions. Later on, they can absolutely pepper a battlefield, filling a, a small area with arrows and hitting everything in the target. 
which is really, really cool for characters like Hawkeye or Legolas in a setting where every single arrow that meets its mark kills a mook. But in D&D that just doesn't happen, and you're much better focusing your fire on a single target, which renders a lot of this stuff moot, especially when one of the key balance features, according to the designers of the game, is Hunter's Mark, which only works on one particular target. So that's why we're not going to go with Hunter for our favourite build here, and I'm instead going to tell you about Swarm Keeper. Swarm Keeper is ridiculous. It's a Looney Tunes level of character. They have a swarm of whatever you like, bees, birds, bats, twiglets, fairies, whatever it is, Mac McFeagal, they follow the character around, and when they make a shot or a melee attack and hit an enemy, they can activate one of three features. The first feature is that they are moved away. So if you're too close to your enemy, you stab them, get carried back because it's forced movement, you don't take an opportunity attack, and you can then proceed to shoot from range as normal. The second feature is that you shoot an enemy and they are carried 15 feet in a direction of your choice by the swarm. So this flock of bees just zooms over, grabs hold of a creature, and if they fail a saving throw, yeets them across the battlefield, putting them either into some terrain effects that you've set up, chucking them off a cliff, or just getting them away from you. It's particularly hilarious because there is no specific size restriction for this. So as long as you can get it to fail a saving throw, you're on a winner. And even for creatures with legendary resistances, it's no cost to you and it can force them to burn through one of those resistances just to avoid getting humiliated by a handful of butterflies. The final thing you can do is add some bonus damage to your attack. We get that, it's cool, it's simple, it works. At later levels, those things improve, the damage gets higher, you can also knock an enemy prone when you move them around, and you, when you're carried back, are surrounded by this swirling storm that gives you half cover until your next turn. It's an incredible list of defensive and offensive abilities that gives you control and can be used every single turn. I cannot stress how much fun it is to play this build, and if you lean into it with a nature-based race that kind of ties in with your swarm, it can create some incredibly fun moments. In terms of shooting style, I'd say rangers are a little bit like modern-day hunters. They're going to carry their arrows in a way that keeps them out of their way, either in a hip or a back quiver. I personally, I personally prefer back quivers because they don't snag on undergrowth quite as much, and they leave you a bit more free to move your legs and run around. Then when they shoot, they're probably using a form of shooting that works for them. They won't shoot in a necessarily in a very formalized Olympic target shooting way, but they will be highly trained and they will have a style that they really enjoy. It's probably instinctive. Rangers probably shoot instinctively, drawing and releasing as part of the same smooth motion. And given that they can sometimes be being carried around by a swarm or something like that, they will have a style that works whether they're standing still or in a different position somewhere. And then have fun changing it up every time you use a different feature from your swarm. Do your swarm cling to the arrow and then fly out and grab? Do they just materialize when the arrow hits? They're not physical creatures, they're face spirits, so you've got a bit of leeway in how you describe that, and it keeps every round fun and different. Next up is rogues. Rogues are another potential contender for like a good archery class. They have a core ability, sneak attack, which increases the damage of the attacks that they make as long as they have advantage against the target, or there's another ally within five feet of it. Which means that they're mostly going to harry the same enemies as your melee characters, but they're going to do it from a distance. Their other thing that they have is their bonus action, cunning action, which lets them, on the same turn that they use their action to attack, do something like dash, disengage, and of course, hide. Careful use of these options, along with your uncanny dodge, can keep you protected in combat until you're able to get to a secure position to shoot from. But if you're constantly finding yourself trapped in melee, you might struggle to still get your sneak attack if you're constantly using your bonus action to disengage just to get a decent shot off. One of the ways around this is to take the Scout subclass. Scout is designed for the kind of well, basically for people who want to play rangers. You get all of the lovely expertise skills that rogues get, but also any time an enemy ends its turn near you, you can use your reaction to run the hell away. Which not only gives you an effective increase to your movement speed if it's happening often, but means that you're never having to use your bonus action to disengage and leaves you open to use it to duck back into cover after taking a shot. Scout pairs very well with almost any race that you might want to play as an archer, with the exclusion of goblin, 
because you've already got the bonus action options that they've got as a rogue and of the swift stride shifter because you've got a better version of their shifting reaction feature but i'd also like to give a little bit of a spotlight to one of my other favorite rogue subclasses inquisitor inquisitor is not the most optimized and it doesn't give you the most options in and out of combat but what it does do is let you sherlock holmes scan an enemy so that you can get your sneak attack bonus against them even if they're not within five feet of an ally meaning it works a little bit like a sneak attack version of hunter's mark you take a bonus action you use your insight on something and then you very carefully place your shot and take it out in terms of races pair this one with either something that has some wacky abilities to keep yourself feeling like you've got some fun options such as the aladrin or some or otherwise something that has a nice bonus to insight a con <sighs> pallid elves for example constantly have advantage on their insight checks which means you're much more likely to succeed on those insight checks and much more likely to get your sneak attack bonus because these rogues don't need to hide in the shadows they can do more dramatic grandstanding a bit like the swashbuckler as they stand in front of their enemy and face them down before placing an arrow right between their eyes for the combat style of rogues, I would say they're not unlike bards in that they will have a style that works for them that they can do from multiple places because they're often crouched down and because they're often crouched down and hiding when they shoot or shooting downwards from a vantage point or quickly making a shot before disappearing into the trees. But because they only make one attack per turn, feel free to portray the rogue as being a bit slower and more methodical. Drawing back and then taking that time to aim before shooting. Maybe they take a breath before every shot just to make sure they've got everything lined up. Because you can't afford to miss a sneak attack. Okay, fair warning, things are about to get silly. Because now we come to Sorcerer. Because Sorcerers are the schmancy classes. Much like Elon Musk or Donald Trump, they inherited the majority of their power and they're just abusing it as best they can. Because although they are fully spellcasters with no particular reason to be adept with any kind of weapon, they do also have access to Green Flame Blade and Booming Blade, which are two cantrips which can consistently increase your damage output of only melee weapon attacks. But it does mean that it's a little harder to come up with a sorcerer concept that uses a bow. <sighs> so we're going to go daft. Sorcerers are excellent at spellcasting, and any sorcerer build is genuinely most of the time going to rely on spells rather than weapons. But this particular sorcerer is an elf, which gives us the proficiency with bows that we need. They grew up and were raised shooting bows. They didn't have a character class yet, but they did discover that they could vaguely harness the natural energies around them, channel it into their bow, and allow them to shoot more accurately. And as they discovered this, they began to abuse it more and more and more. But they did also notice that every now and then when they did that, something weird and magical would happen. That's right, we're going wild magic. The wild magic sorcerer can give themselves advantage on a weapon attack, which then gives the DM the option to activate one of their wild magic surges. If you're very nice to your DM and you talk to them and agree on it, then you might be able to get them to let you activate it instantaneously or on your next turn, meaning that your character deliberately uses a bow in order to force their wild magic to activate as a bit of a gamble to produce a cool magical effect. Your sorcerer isn't gonna rely heavily on archery. In fact, in fact, they're barely gonna use their bow at all, but it is always there as a part of the character. It's almost like a comfort blanket that they have left over from their old days. If you can get hold of a ruby of the war mage, slap that on your bow and you can use it as a spell casting focus and make it a little more present during most of your turns. In terms of shooting style, this particular sorcerer is surprisingly good. Um, they have a very formal archery style that comes from being raised as an elf and trained in lots of formal techniques. They will draw all the way back, but they're a little shaky. They haven't ingrained this to the point where their technique remains perfect throughout. Their release is dodgy. They're constantly anticipating these magical effects. And so they have a reasonable likelihood of missing because dex isn't their main score. If you want a slightly weird way to play an archer, and especially if you're in a game where you don't have to tell everyone in advance what your class is, this can be quite a fun character for a one-shot who turns up as an elf wielding a bow, cracks out the bow, and then starts having weird magic happen to them all the time instead. Getting towards the end now, so the next one that I want to look at is Warlock. And you can't really play a Warlock without looking edgy, so I'm just gonna 
crack up a hood here. Warlocks are sworn and beholden. They have a pact with an ancient or powerful entity that they can draw upon to gain their abilities. They have a relatively limited number of spell slots, especially for what is nearly a full caster in many ways. And that suits us nicely because we want to create a character that most of the time isn't casting spells. So we're going to ignore the, the Eldritch Blast Warlock route and we're going to take our Hexblade. Hexblades are sworn to an entity that embodies a magical weapon. And the majority of the time they rely specifically on melee weapons. But there is a couple of things which can help us out. One is that if you take the Pact of the Blade, then your Hexblade weapon can be any weapon you summon as your Pact. Two is that if you take the Eldritch Invocation Improved Pact weapon, you can summon bows as your Pact weapon, which can run off their spellcasting modifier Charisma instead of Dexterity when they use it. It also then benefits from things like their Hexblade's Curse, where they can curse a particular target to deal more damage to them and be more likely to score critical hits. It also benefits from Hex, and then any of the additional features you can get that improve your Pact weapon, like Thirsting Blade. They also have a version of Divine Smite, Eldritch Smite, which uses their Warlock spell slots to deal incredible amounts of damage and then knock a target prone. The end result of which is actually a surprisingly effective Archer. You can make your two attacks a turn, your Hex brings your damage up to be competent with that of a Ranger, and then your additional Hexblade features take it even further. And then you have the option to go Nova and pump some Smites into the thing when you hit it. In terms of shooting style, you've got some really fun leeway here because you're not shooting using Dex. You're not instinctively shooting. You're not even using Intelligence to think about it. You're using Charisma, which, which means that you basically shoot however feels right to you at the time. You grab your arrow and you effectively just fling it in the direction of the target and hope for the best. If it feels like a big flourish is required, then you do your fancy flourish and you still land on the target. Because it's magical, you can make that as cool and flowery and wonderful as you like. And now we come to the runt of the litter, the bottom of the heap, the last and arguably least, the wizard. Sorry, I'm really demeaning them there. I actually quite like wizards. I think they're a really cool class. Uh, but when I'm trying to come up with archer concepts, they annoy the hell out of me. Wizards are prime spellcasters. They learn their spells from a book, which may or may not look suspiciously like the player's handbook. And they use them abundantly. But they can also use weapons. Blading a subclass combines a wonderful mix of dexterous combat with powerful magic keeping you protected, increasing your damage, and giving the option to use cantrips and weapons in the same turn. But it has a condition. You can't use two hands to make an attack with a weapon. It leaves a one-handed hand crossbow as basically the only option that you can use. So if you're wanting to use one of these and take crossbow expert, play a blade singer. It's genuinely really, really fun. You can cast a big concentration spell and then spend the rest of the time plinking away with your crossbow or interspersing it with firebolts and things like that. It's frustrating to me that this only works with a hand crossbow. If your DM is kind, you might be able to remind them that a short bow does the same damage as a hand crossbow. So balance wise, you could probably get away with using one of these, but it's fun if it's a build you want to play. However, however, I feel like I can't really leave it there. I can't make my last build in the playing archers in D&D thing be a build that you can't actually use with a bow. So I won't. We're going to get silly again. I think we're going to go for a Shadokai, probably Entertainer or something like that as our background. We want anything that gives us proficiency with a disguise kit. And we're going to spend our time disguised as a random undead mook. Why would you do that? People shoot at random undead mooks. Yes, they do. But we're going to play a necromancer. We're going to summon hordes of skeletons that wander and shamble around with weapons and bows and things. And we are going to wander and shamble around in the middle of that horde with a bow of our own indistinguishable from the other undead minions. Meaning that as we plink away, taking shots at our target, we are not the prime target of our enemies. They don't know who to shoot at when they try to take us down. And if they do figure it out, we have our bonus action teleport, which also gives us resistance to all damage as an excellent defensive backup. Get as much mileage out of this as you can at the lower levels. As you start getting a bit higher level, you'll get some buff spells, which can help to improve your ability to actually shoot things with a bow. If you really want to actually make this a thing, 
you'll hit the point where you get sixth level spells. Or if it's a one shot, you might have that right away. And then you're going to take Tensor's transformation. And then as your shambling horde of zombies is picked off one by one, you're going to rise up, grow into the most horrific version of yourself, which frankly is a life goal. Take up your weapon, which you now have advantage with, an extra attack and an additional 2d12 damage on every shot. And absolutely wasteful, dealing powerful damage, powerful attacks, repeat shots, and lay them out. And at the end of it, you're exhausted, you don't want to do it again, and you've played your character to the max. In terms of shooting style, this particular wizard shoots like a zombie. They move slowly and in jerky motions, knock their arrow at a weird angle, and shoot in a way that does not make any sense, but keeps up the facade. Only when they use something like Tensor's Transformation do they start using genuinely proper archery technique. And even then, it's still got vestiges of that undead motion to it. Keep the vibe, keep the fun, and mostly cast spells on your turn. It's, it, it's a better thing. This is just decoration. So that was the last one. Last thing I want to do is basically just chuck all this into a tier system. So at the bottom of the rung, we've got Wizard and Sorcerer, and arguably Druid, mainly because those are the ones that just aren't really using bows properly. They're, the bows are just there for decoration. They're good for one shots though, and a bit of fun. The Druid actually is a viable build. It just doesn't tickle my archery buttons in quite the same way. Next up the rung, I'm going to just go for three tiers here. The middle tier is going to be things like Cleric, possibly Paladin and Barbarian, although those are still kind of fun. And Monk also is, is pretty fun, but they're they're the ones where you're losing something by playing an archer. Like, you get some cool stuff and there's really fun play style, but you have to be aware that you are not optimizing this build if that's what you choose to do. Warlock kind of fits into this just because you have to take so many invocations to keep your archery up to date with everything else. It gives you slightly less flexibility than some of the other Warlock builds. Most of these I'd still recommend playing, you've just got to bear that in mind. And then you've got the top tier. And for me, the top tier is anything that is either designed to play as an archer or just not designed to not play as an archer. So this one includes ranger, obviously, fighter, reasonably obviously, rogue as well, and bard. Bard is a surprise hit when it comes to playing archers. They don't get the fighting style, uh, but neither does a rogue. They get multiple attacks, and they've still got their full spell casting progression to fall back on when they need to. Plus the flourishes are really fun. Even the ones that require you to be in melee range give you some really cool options. So go, get out there. Play more Archer characters because God knows you can watch a lot of podcasts before you find a decent one. And then call me when you get back, darling. I enjoy our visits.